So welcome, uh, Buyana, Camille, and Anastasia. Thank you all for coming to the Ethnic Podcast. We're very happy to have you here sharing your UX experience. Uh, Thank you. So th- to, to, to start off, uh, to, to really get people to, to understand uh, what you do day to day, I, I want to dive into uh, how you work as UX designers and also UX researcher, which is, is a part of, of that, that job. Uh, and I want to start with you, Anastasia. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is it possible to explain how much time you actually spend with the users? I mean, talking with them, uh, observing them, actually interacting with the users in a, in a project or in a month. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, I will start that uh, I do have two jobs at the moment. One of them is for um, Iron Hack, which is a coding school here in Barcelona. And uh, part of my job, 50% of my day is writing uh, the content for students. Uh, so it's not really an office job for that product. You know? mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time, I'm working remotely for uh, Apollon, which is a part of uh, Interactive Corp. And I help them with research. I help them with uh, user experience uh, in general. And uh, I meet users once per two weeks. Mm. We're organizing a session. I recruit the users. Mm. And then I do something with them. or testing something or... It might be a focus group, it might be something else. Mm, right. So at the moment, it's like once per two weeks. But you're meeting them face-to-face? Uh, yeah, face-to-face. And the other time, I might be working with some tracking tools. I might speak with uh, our product uh, owners, um, identify our KPIs, what are we looking for, what are the problems. The typical situation is that they come to me and say, well, we have drop in the conversion rate right. and we have a hypothesis why it's happening see the metrics and then you're like okay let's think what we can do how we can solve it how can we understand why it's happening and, hmm. and that's the kind of like the, uh, the amount of time that Apollon needs a UX researcher uh, like twice twice uh, every second week is that uh, yeah, mainly because I don't have that much time at the moment. Right, right. Before. So you would like to do it more? or? Yeah, usually I do that once a week. Ah, okay. But now because of the content writing for students. Right, you're busy. Know, yeah. Busy. <laughs> so, so moving on to you, Buyana. I mean, uh, you're doing uh, UX at a type form, a company that most of us know. Uh, I mean, you have thousands of users and, and you're also famous for being a user-driven company. I guess UX is, is very important for you. Uh, is it possible to, to, in any way, kind of define what's UX in Thai form? So, well, um, UX in general, I think, for me, is, is the user's voice, right? Um, through a lens of somebody who's trained in understanding um, and getting, uh, getting to understand the problems that the user is having, right? So I think that's general, and I don't think it's any different in type form, at least it's not for me. Um, we have, um, the way we work is that we have our UX designers and uh, UI designers embedded in swarms and teams, um, working with developers in QA and uh, uh, Scrum Masters and, and product people and product owners and so everybody kind of works together but um, so there's research happening all the time there's communication with customers happening all the time and I I like to look at it as per project so usually there's some hypothesis that you have and something that you want to find out and depending on that question you design the communication and the interaction with the customer. Mm-hmm. Our customers happen to move a lot of them overseas in the U.S., so we talk to them via video, uh, via voice or phone, and when we can, we like to have them come in. Yeah, right. and, and is it the same, I mean, uh, in terms of how much you talk with them? Mm-hmm. Is it possible to say it's probably very different from project to project? But Well, it seems like it's happening <laughs> all the time, right? Because each, each team is working on its own project in a way, right? So mm-hmm. there's a total of five UX designers all together. Okay. And so there's, I hear people dialing and ma- making phone calls to customers every day, mm-hmm. every week, you know, it, somebody is working on it. But I think generally probably what you say every 
every week or two at some point. Um, but like I said, it, it's, it's a project basis. So um, there is a project currently that's happening where we are uh, trying to map out the user journey for a particular type of customer. Mm -hmm. And so, but that's kind of a bigger project where everybody's talking and it's taken, you know, four to six weeks to put it together. So how many times? As many as needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's hard to say. And sometimes we need more and sometimes Right. I mean, and that's for Typeform with, with, I mean, millions of users. And then you have, uh, Camille, you, you, you're at Kipu. I mean, a, a fairly a big startup both in Spain and Europe, but it, it's still, it's another scale. Uh, and I mean, you're, you don't have like a huge team of, of UX people around you, like most startups, they don't. I mean, what, what's, how's, how's your, your approach? Yeah, um, I think it, it's, in Kipu at least, well, it, it's a team effort. Um, despite not having many designers here, um, we share roles. We have a product owner, um, we have the customer support team, and we try to um, collaborate. It's, um, it's a constant discussion collaboration between us. Um, then we have developers to find constraints, but um, in terms of users, um, I have a lot of metrics here. Um, we have a good BI to, to monitor everything. Um, and um, oh, shit. Do you, I've seen you do some UX interviews here at, at, at work. Is that like uh, your main uh, approach in terms of understanding how people use your product? Yes, but that's at a later stage when, um, when we have a prototype. Um, mm. Beforehand, we identify problems um, with our product team, mm. with, uh, with customer support. Mm. Um, especially now, for example, with, uh, with uh, the new project that we have, um, we identify problems with one particular group of customers, like, like you in Typeform. Um, and we tried beforehand. We tried to identify the main problems they have while working, and it was that they they have problems verifying their information. Um, I mean, it, not like problems, but uh, more like um, uh, how to say that. I'm losing my channel. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, they they have problems verifying information in terms of it, it's a industry problem. Mm -hmm. So they they. They are bookkeepers and they get to go through a lot of information and we had to dive into their workflows and, and accommodate to that. Um, so you had a couple of, of calls with, with them beforehand. Well, upon the identifying the problem, um, we went to do prototyping. And after that, these, do, that, these were the interviews that, that you might, might have seen here. Hmm. Uh, and I mean, Anastasia, you're, you're also talking about uh, your approach, having people uh, face to face at your office, especially with Apalon. Uh, I mean, what kind of people do you gather? I mean, you're, are you going out to the street and getting 10 random people? Or, uh, I mean, what kind of users are you looking for? Uh, well, before you recruit any user, of course, you have to understand the, your user types, your user personas. That's why before I was saying that UX research is not really uh, a, a new will invented. This is a hybrid role that has a lot of um, academic research taken from... Uh, from the past, mm. it's just the, right. It's just the prefix UX that just defines that. Okay, we're 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 doing everything based right. on the principles of user experience because right. it's something a little bit new. But the research part is something that also is done by marketing people, sales, mm. uh, because like they identify market feed, market acceptance with their own methods and, and mm. techniques. What we're doing uh, and what I'm doing in particular at the moment, um. I'm trying to to search for people that are uh, complement with the profiles of our user personas of our segments. Mm -hmm. Marketers uh, call it segments. Right. We call it user personas. Uh -huh. So we just look for the profiles um, uh, with the age that we're looking for, uh, with their occupation, with the same motivations uh, that we mm -hmm. have researched before, and we know them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean. As you say, I mean, this is like a collaborative effort of everyone in, inside the company and, right. and also, I mean, UX research is not something new as you added, Buyana. I mean, uh, for me, it's kind of hard to understand uh, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the new thing about UX research compared to other research done by other people, you know, in other sectors. Is it, is it, is it hard to define or is it there's kind of like a definition? So, what's new? Or different. Yeah, what's different is the kind of end product, right? Like the digital interfaces, the prevalence mm -hmm. of those, the actual technology side is new. Mm. 
But the way that you solve a problem through creative thinking has been around for thousands of years, right? Like you have really long um, industry, or to, you know, architecture and industrial design that have been doing this for, for a long time. And these kinds of um, approaches, like interviewing the customer, finding out what their problem is, you know, designing for somebody else, yeah. has been around for a very long time. Maybe some of the t tools and techniques have evolved, yeah. and we give them different names, maybe, and there's new words mm -hmm. that represent it, right? Like UX, user experience design, it wasn't called that before. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, um, systems engineering, or mm -hmm. it was information architect. I mean, still there is, and there's specific information architects that deal with just that. But um, it's the out, the process is very similar. Um, it's improved, it's evolved, mm. but it's something that people have been doing for a long time. Right, right. So, you, 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 I mean, it, it is an advantage having a UX researcher on board in your startup, but it's not a necessity in, in the start? or I think it is. I think it is because um, the closer you get to the customer and what they're actually doing, the mm. more you will um, have confidence or the more likely it will be that you will actually solve a problem that, they, that needs to be solved. Mm. Right, I don't think there is ever a time what's early enough, or um, I think from the beginning you see the value of UX mm. research. Um, and then there's, you know, it, there's really a lot of overlap. Usually I work, for me personally, I've usually worked somewhere uh, from research and um, like high fidelity wireframes, right? Mm -hmm. so I think it's really important for the person who's doing the research and communicating with the customers where possible mm -hmm. to be actually translating the findings into right. something, mm -hmm. some kind of a solution because that person is there. Um, the, the, the reports that come out of it or the documentation that we deliver as a result of the research, mm -hmm. it's a way to communicate what was discovered and what was found, but there's no replacing for actually being there. Mm. A type form we try to have as many people involved in the actual interview process. So mm -hmm. product owners, engineers are invited. Right. Occasionally, at least, you know, you can't be there every day, and it's certainly not their core competency, right? Like, mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. But see, <laughs> being there and seeing and empathizing with the customer and seeing what happens when they use the product or seeing what they say mm. is incredibly powerful. And mm -hmm. I think it's really valuable for, especially maybe a small, small startup where there is a handful of people for everybody to be there at some point when the interviews are happening and actually listening to the customers. It's, it's wow. super valuable. So, I mean, you know, in the beginning, some a lot of research is done also, can be done by product owners. I mean, there's books out there like Erica Hall's Just Enough Research um, that I would highly recommend for a team that's maybe starting. Maybe, you know, they don't have specifically a UX designer, but there's no reason why they can't talk to customers. However, it's really important to understand how to talk to customers and what kind of questions to be asking. And I think right. that's where um, the experience of a UX researcher really, or a UX designer in general, is that through experience and through having talked to customers, you find out what are the right questions to ask. And that's really important. Yeah, because that, that's what, what the next thing I want to dive into, like <laughs> what are the right questions to ask. I mean, we can start with you, uh, Camille. I mean, uh, I've actually been part of your UX uh, research myself, going through your project product. But uh, I really don't, don't remember what kind of question you ask. But what do you, what are your can you say like what are your favorite questions? Oh, favorite, I, I don't have my favorite questions. Um, I guess it depends on the exercise that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that particular one that we did was to test a, test a set of wireframes. And um, at that moment, um, I like to just observe and watch users. Mm -hmm. um, I ask them to speak out loud um, their chain of thought. So whatever they're doing, um, whatever they think they're doing, um, I like to hear that. I, I look for reactions to to mm -hmm. to the project. Mm -hmm. um, to what they see on the screen, and um, mm -hmm. I generally like to see the user that's using the live thing. Um, in terms of questions, um, I beforehand I ask users what do they expect to see mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, what do they expect um, this the solution would, ideal solution would be to the to their problem? Mm -hmm. um, that I I would say that that would be my my favorite question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right for you as well. Uh, yeah, as well. I would just point and add a little bit that there's uh, a golden rule for researchers and UX designers as well. Right. Uh, always ask open questions, never close questions. Like, don't ask me, oh, so you really like it? Or mm. like, give mm -hmm. them multiple answers. Mm. 
and act really naive so like so that the user really feels that you, you don't even know nothing about this product right and this way they kind of feel themselves okay I'm, I'm the leading one here and I'm gonna say a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that comes with with experience of course yeah but uh, don't be judgmental just the human behavior is natural it's natural to want to um, kind of uh, make the other person happy in a way, mm -hmm. right? Like so, when customers come in and they start talking to you, if you give them any indication what you mm -hmm. want them to say, mm -hmm. they're gonna try to say it. If they see mm -hmm. that you're interested in them saying a certain thing, they're gonna try to echo those expectations. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be super neutral and kind of pretend yeah. you don't know or you know whatever that means to you, so that you can just let them tell you what, what they think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, but, sorry, yeah, otherwise you lose the money that you invest in, in, in your yeah, special because you might as well I mean, not be doing this. It's, yeah. it's expensive. Yeah. It's expensive because you have to recruit them, you have to pay them. I mean, it's super nice if they're ready to do it for free, but... Yeah, but, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a balance, right? Because it, it's, it's hard being both neutral, super neutral, and also getting really valuable answers, right? It, it seems to me, or, or, or no? It's I don't more think like. Two are opposing, yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Um, I think um, you have to make it straight before the interview. Say there is no right or wrong, mm -hmm. um, and it's not that hard to be neutral. In fact, um, you just um, you guide users through right questions, through to small conversation, and um, most importantly, there is no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And I guess I mean soft skills got to be quite important yeah. as a UX designer then to get people getting people under skin a bit, you know, getting them comfortable, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and I mean, uh, I, I was because I was, there is, I mean, both the qualitative approach that we're talking about now, talking to users, but also the quantitative, uh, you know, approach, looking at numbers. Uh, we are not a type for, I mean, what, I mean, at least because you're dealing with such a vast amount of, of users, uh, what, what's most important for you? So the numbers give you one side of the story, and we're really lucky at Typeform, we have a great, um, head of analytics and a team who is focused on crunching the numbers and mm -hmm. getting the insights and answering these really big, important business questions. Yeah. And sometimes they can also answer some of our user questions. So, um, But analytics is one part of the story, right? The other part of the story, that what numbers can't tell you is what's actually... Um, much more specific, so like how people are feeling, mm -hmm. uh, what are the specific tax, tasks that they're doing, why they're doing them. There's all kinds of questions that, so I, I look at analytics and interviews or qualitative research as complementary to each mm -hmm. other. One without the other really is not as powerful. Mm -hmm. Two, when they're uh, combined, are incredibly powerful and valuable. Mm -hmm. So when we, um, and there are certain types of questions that are better answered with analytics, and okay. there are certain types of questions that are better answered with interviews. And so what a skilled um, UX designer will know when to employ the right tactic, right? So a lot of it, and, and the, the answer always in UX design seems to be like, well, it depends. And because every situation is slightly different, depending on your customer base, depending on the question you're seeking to answer, if you're looking to be more explorative, if you're looking to be more validative, or in, um, if you're seeking to innovate, or um, I don't know what the other word is, but incremental. So if you're seeking to innovate in an open way, or you're seeking to incrementally improve something, it's very different techniques that are applied for each one. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that I was always curious about is uh, I might be wrong, but when doing research, I mean, how about, how much is about usability and how much is about creating a great experience? I mean, because, yeah. I think the two are complementary. Yeah, Nastasia, what, what do you think? Well, talking about usability, it, it, uh, this is something that actually exists for a long time. I think it's like the, in the beginning of 90s, the, the term was yeah. officially... <laughs> Um, pretty fine and um, you know it can be understood as a design framework mm. as a design process even mm. but also we can use usability as uh, heuristics to mm. evaluate our usability tests mm. right so they don't but, conflict at but all but you're right it's more like a mechanical part of, mm. of user experience right right huh. probably less human than yeah 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 
Huh. I, yeah, I think the two are complementary. So you have like the kind of heuristics and the overall, because human biology hasn't changed that much and it's not going yeah. to anytime soon, right? Like the same cognitive biases that we have and emotional reactions or uh, mm. intellectual reactions, whatever it is that the human, that drives us, that human part is really the same. Mm. Um, mm. But what's changed is the environment in which we exist, like the technology part. So it's adapting that. So that I think heuristics has to do a lot with that. And then the, the but yeah. you know, using something easily and being able to get through a task and at the end of the day actually get whatever job to, that you want to get done. And this mm. is like a huge thing right now. Everybody's talking about jobs to be done mm. in the product side, and this is really you know, tremendously overlaps with UX. We have tons of tools and techniques yeah. that are exactly that. Mm. So give, give, allowing the customer to do what they wanted to do, yeah. not what we want them to do, but what they want to do creates the experience and the value. And then in addition, you have the emotional component and how that feels from like a very visual side. Mm. Um, so so, so when, and then when the two parts work really well, I think that's when you have a really great experience. Like it functions really well and it's super good. And it looks really nice, and you're, it's pleasing to you, and that's more the emotional component. So yeah. I think the two are really important. Huh. You really can't. Yeah, yeah. It's huh. really hard to have one with the other. Yeah. I mean, you can, but the, the, the functionality is very utilitarian, and then there's emotion. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I want to move on, because you're, you're talking about how you're interacting with other people in the company as well, uh, which is a, a big part of the UX role. I mean, you're not solo players. And uh, I mean, I wanted to ask uh, you, Camille, first, is it, is it hard to get like buy-in from other people in company? Uh, is it hard to convince other people in, in Kipu uh, of your findings? I mean, if you have something that's you know conflicting with, with the, your developers' thoughts, I mean, how do you convince them that, I mean, what you've found is, is the right thing, the right way to go? Um, I guess I'm lucky enough not to have these problems. Um, wow. But um, wow. always after every research, after every every, uh, every interview we do or any any kind of research, I write summary and action action items. Um, mm. And, you know, there are reasons in, in, the, in those documents and I just present every, all my findings to them. And if there is anything unclear on, on the screen that they see that they have to develop, I just bring up these reasons. Um, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, Kipu, I would say, is a pretty much, I wouldn't say a design mature company because we don't have a huge design uh, UX team, um, but definitely th this is something that we, uh, we, we will follow in the next years. We will um, grow our design team and we put a strong focus on design. Hmm. And uh, how is that for you? I mean, you also talk about how you're bringing engineers into interviews, how you're trying to like merge everyone into the same process. But is it has it been times when it's hard to convince people that what you found is the truth? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it hasn't been super difficult. I think we're lucky as well. But I think what's critical is involving in any company, involving people from the beginning, mm. letting them go through the journey with you, mm. and having the experience and sitting in the interview and seeing what happens has a tremendous impact on people. And of course, there's you know sometimes there's people that have their own opinion and. You know, they feel very strongly about it, and so the way I've gone around that is essentially to bring those, especially those individuals, in as early as possible, and and let them see what was happening. Because the point of you being a UX, or you know, when you're doing the interviews, is not to supplement or to to supersede the user's opinion with your own or to, to get what you want, it's to get what they want and hmm. it's a very subtle difference and I think that it's easy sometimes to lose track. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah, getting people involved early on. Is, is it, uh, I just thought of it, but is it, I mean, soft skills are needed to talking with the users, but are the, that same soft skills also used talking with other people in the company? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think where the difficulty comes in, maybe at some bigger companies too, where I've been in the past, um, the the business side that's mm -hmm. the most removed from the customer ha can sometimes have the hardest time because there is there's this balancing act that's happening between business needs and user right. needs, yeah. and it's where the two overlap that the business can thrive because if the business cannot um, sustain itself, then mm -hmm. can't sustain itself and it's you know downward spiral. But if the customers aren't getting what they need or doing what they need to do or what they want to do then they're not going to be customers. So mm -hmm. it's it's really finding the overlap. And, and, and uh, what I found is really effective is communicating 
the customer's needs in business terms and always tying the two together. Mm -hmm. So this is what the customer wants and it's going to serve the business like this and this is how they overlap and really showing that overlap and that seems to be pretty effective. Hmm. It's not easy. No, no. And we're human imagine. and everybody has their things, right? Like you can get attached to a solution or an idea, yeah. but it's really important to talk about it. Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I mean, uh, Typeform is a fairly big company now, 150 people. I mean, Apollon, how many people are working in Apollon? Uh, uh, the development center, which is in Minsk, I think something around 100 people. So it's a fairly big company as well. It's a fairly big company, yeah. yeah and we have different profiles and. Uh, I think it's quite uh, quite similar to, to your cases. I also try to involve people uh, to take participation, even if it's remotely. I ask them observe online what's going on, mm, right? And testing, huh. see it on your own, and just take the notes. Right. Usually, when you do the, the usability testing, there's always a note taker sitting next mm -hmm. to you, and that's exactly what I'm asking them to do. Right. Either a product manager or uh, a developer sometimes. And I mean, you, you told me earlier that you came in uh, at a later stage in Apollon and that they, 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 yeah. they've been doing their things uh, like user, re user research, uh, research wise uh, without a UX specialist. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, do, you have, do you have an opinion on when should a company or a startup or a technology company hire a dedicated UX person? Uh, uh, depends, of course. Depending on what? Uh, depending on, I think, a lot of factors. Uh, startups, they, they, do a lot, they do have a lot of uh, problems apart from UX in general. There are a lot of challenges, first of all, mm. to cope with. Uh, and uh, yeah, you may hire a, a UX specialist in the very beginning, and that will help you with the preliminary research to identify user problems, user needs, and, and probably build your product around that. Mm. But there's a different approach, uh, which can also work. Like mm. in Apple case, for example, they have been, they had a, a nice um, marketing people, salespeople, and business intelligence, uh, data scientists. So altogether, all these skills made a good mm. mixture together, and they found a way to to build products that went well. Mm. So it's possible. Yeah. So now I'm 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 more like a, you know a, a new way of. <clears throat> Optimizing the product. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Camille, you, you're a part of what you can call like a fairly not an early stage startup, but uh, like, you know, there are not, not hundreds of people. Uh, and I mean, you're the first UX designer, right? Yeah. Uh, do you did you see that they were doing things different than before you arrived? Are you do, doing things different now? Um, again, I try to be a voice of a customer. Um, before that, it was a product owner product manager who did who did these things um, so they were doing uh, call it UX to some extent yeah. um, but there was no no dedicated person to do just that mm -hmm. um, so I would say you should hire as early as possible um, but UX isn't cheap mm -hmm. uh, UX is time-consuming and it's also you have to budget for it right uh, to recruit people and and pay for for them to to have interviews it's it's not it's not cheap mm -hmm. It's an investment, I think, and it is the kind of investment that reduces risk. Mm -hmm. So having a UX designer on board really helps you reduce the risk of totally getting it wrong. Yeah. And I think, to me, that's super valuable, right? Like, um, especially in an industry, or, you know, as a startup, you have a tremendous amount of risk, not just whether the product is going to work. Or right, anything. yeah. And so any way that you can do that, so I look at it as something that can be helpful from the beginning way and it's worth the investment and hmm. I would you know as a, as a startup I would even I know it's it's it sounds but hire somebody senior hire somebody and spend the money ahead of time like the same way you would invest in development and, hmm. and so you have the same kind of mindset for hiring developers as hiring I think it's UX just designers. as important yeah they're two two sides of the same coin right mm -hmm. like um and the stronger structure, it's like having a two-footed stool versus a three-footed stool. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So because yeah. you worked in a fairly uh, a fair amount of, of early stage startup yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and you then you came in at the early stage as well, or yeah. 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 So what some some of my clients have done is that essentially hired a you know kind of a contract on a contract basis, and that's entirely possible too, right? 
And um, if you can't afford to have somebody full time for you know every day, hire them in the beginning stages to set the course to some extent. Now, the the more experience that person has, the more quickly they're going to be able to you know give you the right advice. And and so it's it's like spending more now so that you can um, save later in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because you worked in several uh, early stage startups and now you're working in Typeform, just evolving into like a, a real company. And uh, and uh, I mean, talking with a lot of people in the beginning, uh, and you're trying to kind of uh, find a path for your product, and you're getting all this feedback from people telling you, oh, that would be great if you did did this, that would be amazing. I mean, how do you stay? And this is for all of you, but how do you stay focused on 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 your vision or your, your I mean, your yeah, your product? What you yeah. want to build? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's where it becomes an art form. Um, uh, at the end of the day, I think what's in, in the early stages, more than anything, what's important is defining the problem, right? Like, what's the real problem that needs to be solved? And, and really focusing on that. And um, if you understand the technology that you're trying to build or, you know, the, the capabilities that you have, then you can apply to that and go, okay, where did the two connect? Like, this is the problem that needs to be solved. This is the kind of direction that we're building and trying to find the overlap. It's, it's super hard. I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and say this, but um, in the moment, and, and it's not a magic, magic, um, one of those things that just you wave a wand and it happens, right? Like... Mm -hmm. It doesn't eliminate risk. It right. just reduces it, yeah. and you're more informed. Hmm. Um, it's still really easy to fail. I mean, how many startups are out there that you've never heard of, right? And hmm. So few actually yeah. make it, but we don't talk about those stories. But it's important to keep that in mind. And not only that, um, I actually was just uh, at a UXLX, and Jeff Patton was there. And his talk was mm -hmm. that um, failure is not what you should be afraid of. It's that kind of in between, like it's neither right nor wrong, kind of like uh, it's not terrible, but it's not good either. That kind of like mm -hmm. dead zone in the middle where it's like some things happen, but we don't know what. Yeah. So it's not failure that we should really be afraid of. It's this kind of uh, purgatory, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, um, <laughs> you know, um, feeling is, is good because it tells you what you're really doing wrong and it gives you a lot more information mm -hmm. than like kind of sort of getting it right. right. And I think that so so it, in, in an effort to eliminate that, I think that's the problem um, definition in the beginning and not solving mm -hmm. yeah. for a problem until you know what the real problem is, right? right. Like that, hmm. knowing how long to stay there. Yeah, and I mean, you, you talked about also uh, in, in regard to this understanding of the technology, because uh, I, I wondered, I mean, how, how, how developed do you need to be as a, as a coder? Um, Camille, and I know that you, you do some development, some coding, but I mean, how, how, how advanced of a coder do you need to be a developer, do you need to be to, to work you know, efficiently as a UX designer? Um, UX in general is a, is a quite interesting field because you can have many backgrounds. Um, I happen to have some development background, but it was a long time ago. Um, I understand how programming works, and that helps me understand constraints that developer project to me. Um, you don't have to be coder at all. Um, but in a startup, the more skills you have, the, the better off you are. Mm. So um, I would say coding is a, is a good um, complement, complementary mm. skill. Right. Um, mm. I do coding only because sometimes there is a uh, development team works hard on, on the product, heavy on the product. I yeah. just do small things. Yeah. yeah. Um, huh. Just as, a, as an aid to, to my team, right. otherwise. Is that the same for you, Nastasia? Do you think UX designers should code or do you think it's important? Um, let's say, let, let's view that from different perspectives. There are different types of, of developers, of hmm. course. Let's say if we're having, for example, Apple. Hmm. Um, we have uh, native mobile development, but we also have machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, mm. which is a little bit advanced, mm. and it's a little bit more complex than just the, the usual backend development. Right. Uh, and these people are uh, creating amazing things that users do already feel that it's working. Mm. They feel that interfaces become more and more 
smart yeah. and they require more and more from these interfaces. Right. As I'm speaking to users uh, like once in a week, once in two weeks, yeah. apart from you know solving our daily problems related to our product, mm -hmm. I also see them demanding more and more every day about that, about the way uh, interfaces should be mm. now and in the future. Mm. So I guess going forward maybe becomes more and more important, or it, yeah, it becomes more and more important. But probably not having the the skills of a developer, but just understand what they're doing right. and uh, understand the limitations. I think. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, uh, do you do you code yourself? No, I I went to a ten week uh, dev boot camp, a Ruby on Rails training, and right, man, it was so hard. And then I realized how much of a designer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really not my core competency at all. Uh, but I think, uh, as Camille said, it really, and associate, it, it depends on the environment. Like mm -hmm. in a startup, uh, having being a really strong generalist mm -hmm. will be really helpful. At a big company where you have these very, very narrow roles and you can go deep into one subject, it's more useful to really be an expert. It's really hard to be good at everything. Um, and by the time somebody is good at everything, usually, um, you know, it takes you to decades, right? Like you'd have to, and, and then if things are changing so much with, des you know, design development, things shift all the time that mm -hmm. by the time you're not doing one job for a while. But yeah. what stays with you is those um, overall concepts and understanding where the pitfalls might be. But I don't know, to some extent, you know, sometimes it can also be good not to not to have any of that background because it, then you're not limit or you're less limited maybe, you know, like um, it's that uh, story of the bumblebee, like the reason it can fly is because nobody told him you can't because they're so not aerodynamic, right? <laughs> Look at a bumblebee, you're like, how is that happening? Yeah. But um, so it, it, sometimes it's good to have that naive friend mm. mindset in a good way, naive. Mm. That's cool. And you're talking about how you know everything is changing so fast, and it's hard to, to keep updated. Uh, and I guess that's the same for UX. I mean, UX is evolving as well. UX research as well is evolving. Uh, and I wanted to hear with you guys that are working with this every day. I mean, uh, what's UX in 2017 is probably not what you know, what was UX you know a couple of years ago. Camille, I mean, uh, are you are you working in the same way as you did a couple of years ago? Are you seeing some trends changing? Um. I guess, well, working the same or not, you adapt to, to environment and projects. So mm. I'm not really um, aware of the of if I'm working very much different. Mm. Um, I always stay true to the problem that, mm. that, that I solve. Mm. Uh, but I think in terms of trends for 2017, or maybe even 2018, 19, I, I was getting into anticipatory design. Mm -hmm. and Can I, you explain? You know, what um, is that? <laughs> wow. Well, um, it has to do something with... Uh, with um, AI-backed uh, design, mm. um, the, so the interface changes as mm -hmm. as user uses it, ah, okay. um, and it, that's fed to it by by the artificial intelligence. Sorry, that's fed to it by artificial inte intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, that's more or less overall concept. I'm not mm. an expert so about that, so I'm, I don't really wanna no, no, go no. in detail. But that's right. more or less it. All right. I, mean, we are, I know you guys are also working with conversational interfaces and some AI-powered. Stuff. I mean, what are you so thinking? So that, that's what we're looking at. Uh, like, is that the right direction to go? And it, so, as as an industry, or as a uh, as a as as a job, I don't think UX has changed a ton. Um, I think that development changes a lot more in the sense of like language is constantly evolving. This is cool. This is great. This is getting better. Like, there's the technology is really changing quite a bit in UX. Um, it's really creative problem solving from the beginning, right? Like, um, it, it's not so fluid. Design trends are fluid. Mm -hmm. with the, like, what's popular, what kind of, you know, colors, what kind of interactions, animations, things like that are evolving very quickly. But fundamental, like, research and, and UX design, I don't, think, mm -hmm. I don't think it's evolving as quickly. But um, to this kind of anticipatory anticipatory design and using AI to essentially make the interface more intelligent, respond to the person as they're working in the moment so that it can, um, it's predicting what they might do to some extent, right? So a type form, yeah, conversational, what does conversational mean? I think that um, we're, we're still kind of defining that, right? Like, 
Uh, what does it mean to our customers? Are, are we going to have the same customers today as we have in three years? It's probably, you know, might not be the same, same as that customer base. Um, and what does conversational design mean to them? So those are the questions we're trying to answer. But um, I think I might have rambled a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question. No, 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 no. I mean, I feel like you're, you're on board with the same things. I don't know with you, Nastasia. You're, you're teaching the UX, the UXer of the future at, at Iron Hack. I mean... Are you are you teaching them the latest trends, or I mean, what, what do you think are, are 2017? We're giving them the basics of what are the trends in society, what are the trends in technologies. And right. We're not really, you know, it's really hard to predict. What we totally all understand is that things are going to go really, really fast, hmm. really, really fast. And as I said before, uh, during my uh, research studies, I can see that users are becoming more and more demanding in terms of the quality of these interfaces and being, yeah, hmm. especially hmm. if you do tests with digital natives, people that were born like after uh, the middle of 90s. Right. They got used to solve their problems with digital solutions already. So they expect more than, for example, our generation. Hmm. We still can use the paper for something. Yeah. Huh. And the, the younger, like my nephew, for example, when he was... Um, uh, now he's 10, but when he was 5, he expected, um, he have seen the comics, uh, like an elephant or something. But he also saw an iPad already, and he was like, yeah, but I want this elephant to be in my iPad, and that's exactly what he's expecting. Hmm. Because that's what he saw, that's hmm. his mental model already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, huh. that's interesting. I think that that's the way it's going to change a little bit we would have to develop new principles of evaluating the, the user experience hmm. i think generally uh let's say time uh, between users and computers will reduce hmm. yeah let's talk about the future we're going some interaction is going to be essentially less interaction with screens yeah yeah, yeah. Um, huh. Things that yeah. we can do for people, and that's even something now that I, uh, I think about all the time. Like, how can we essentially remove the step? Is there something we can do for users that they don't have to do? Like, we can think for them, and finding all those little things to remove cognitive loads, so that it seems exactly. like the computer knows what you want. Um, it doesn't really, right? But it's going to predict it, and maybe mm -hmm. there will eventually be some kind of intelligent enough. AI that can support some of those things, and over time, it's the disambiguation taking away rather than adding more interaction, and then switching some of the interaction to voice, um, things that can be done with voice easier than interface, and then there's, of course, things that can be done easier with an interface rather yeah. than a voice, like, I don't think voice is, like, everything's going to be voice, it's just probably not realistic, um, yeah, and, and t taking the screen away to, like, to what, what does mixed reality look like? Um, hmm. Instead of having a screen, the information is... In, I mean, there's probably pitfalls and problems with that, too, right? Like, <laughs> well, yeah. You need to be able to see where you're on in the physical world and not be too distracted mm. at the same time. But, mm. yeah, we'll see what happens. It's yeah. very exciting, and I think there's a lot of things that yeah. are going to be happening in the next decade like that. Yeah, thank, th thanks, thanks all of you for giving us some insight into the future of, uh, of UX and our, our digital products. So... I probably have like uh, 20 more questions I would like to, to, to ask you guys because, I mean, you're, you're, you're sharing a lot of interesting experience with us, but at some point you have to say stop. Uh, but I, I just want to say, uh, Camille, Buyana, and also Anastasia, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing. Yeah.